We have Meredith Whitaker. So if you weren't awake yet for session one, then you're going to be treated to, um, to Meredith's perspectives. If you were already awake when session one was taking place, you'll already know how interesting her work on artificial intelligence and its role in society is. Meredith, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Hello. Hi. Now, often I think when people think of ethics and artificial intelligence, often when I discuss artificial intelligence, <laughs> People raise concerns about, you know, people bring up films like The Terminator and Skynet and this fear of um, machines becoming more intelligent than us. Now, that is very different from the kind of concerns that you're raising here today. C could you explain the, the difference? Yeah, it, it certainly is different. I think, you know, frankly, those concerns are a distraction from the real material harms that we're seeing around us all over. Um, my AI Now co-founder, Kate Crawford, talks about the sort of apex predator concerns where you have tech executives like Elon Musk who are already top of the food chain, to use that metaphor, and the only thing they can think about that's scarier than themselves is a sentient AI, who you know, the Terminator. Um, but this is not, you know, how technical infrastructure works. You can always unplug a server. So there's some kind of, you know, fantastical thinking going on what we really need to worry about is the way in which AI is concentrating power with the people who already have it, concentrating privilege with the people who are already wealthy and privileged and disempowering the rest of us. Now, this is something you must know very intimately. You're not commenting on this from the outside. You worked at Google for, for over a decade. 13 years and five days. What actually led to your <laughs> departure after 13 years and five days? Well, um... There's a lot of answers to that question, but the short answer is that as my concerns around these unethical and exploitative uses of AI grew, um, I began to realize that even as I was speaking about them, even as we were researching them at AI Now, we weren't seeing the kind of changes that we would need to sort of stop some of the worst harms. And that what we really needed was, you know, some form of power that would be able to check these. So I started labor organizing. I started organizing with my colleagues around issues of kind of workplace exploitation, but also around issues of the unethical application of these tools and the way in which, you know, Google was, was sort of signing secretive contracts with the DOD, building a censored search engine for the Chinese market, and, you know, effectively following profit and revenue, even as it countered the public interest. Now, is this something that in your, in your time at Google, did, did the situation change, or was it more that your awareness of the situation evolved over that time? Well, I, I, I'm sure both, but I think, you know, when you are looking at a corporation in the context of shareholder value-driven capitalism, the situation is always changing because the goal is to constantly and forever increase revenue. So to do that, you need to break into new markets. You need to cross boundaries that might have been a guardrail a decade ago. You need to figure out how to continue increasing the money you're making at a rate that will keep shareholders happy. And I think that is the fundamental issue we're dealing with. Should we have, you know, institutions that are now more powerful than most nation states, driven by these incentives, driven by the forever pursuit of increasing revenue goals, making determinations that are so socially sensitive, that are reshaping our geopolitics, that are reshaping our culture, that are reshaping our social institutions? And the answer is obviously no. <laughs> Assuming everyone agrees <laughs> yeah. with you that the answer is yeah. obviously yeah. no, how do we begin to avoid that? It, it feels, f from your presentation, from what we already know about artificial intelligence, Ladies that we're already very far down this path. Take your how do we not the only next stop the about progress, to begin. but take a step back and take stock of where we are? Well, to, to reference Ursula Le Guin for a moment, um, you know, the divine right of kings also felt that way. So I think there is always a potential for change, but it is very rare that you see massive structural change without social movements involved. It is very rare that you know you, you see kind of the powerful capitulate without some power to check them. And so this is why in addition to regulation, in addition to justice-minded research that is asking better questions and telling more accurate stories about this technology, we also need organizing and social movements that can begin to stand up 
to these forces. And is that something you see yourself as having an active role in? I will be in solidarity with those movements anytime I can, anywhere I can. I'm proud to have participated in a small way, and I'm really grateful to see how the tech worker movement and the sort of you know social movements around these issues have just exploded in the last couple of years. Now, the concerns you raise are very broad, very general, but you give specific examples as well. Do you think some of the examples we're given of the benefits that artificial intelligence can offer have validity? Do you think there are some real benefits we can we can reap from these kinds of technologies? I think, I mean, sure. But I don't think we can talk about benefits in the general, right? Where are these benefits? How are they measured? Who is benefiting? Because, of course, the harms I, you know, I, I enumerated the specific ways in which people are being exploited and and you know and cut off from resources and opportunity are also benefiting some people, right? There are some people who are getting mightily rich off this, right? So we need to be specific about who benefits, who bears the risk, and how are we measuring those claims? And right now, that's that's where you know we lose the thread. It, I mean, it's your concern that we're exacerbating problems which already exist and or, or creating entirely new problems? Both, absolutely. So yeah. could, you, could you give an example, I suppose, of when we're creating a problem that, that we haven't really faced before thanks to artificial intelligence? Well, I mean, I think, I think I'll, I'll sort of answer both. I think we are exacerbating problems that already exist because, of course, AI reflects the logics and culture of the people who create it. It reflects these, you know, sort of very homogeneous Silicon Valley, mainly male population. It also reflects what's in the data it's trained on. So that is all, you know, historical marginalizations and patterns of discrimination get embedded in the logic of AI. And, you know, thanks to journalism and, you know, some deep research, we have a lot of evidence of that. The people who are harmed by AI bias are always people who have been historically marginalized. There is no AI system I have seen that is biased against white men as a standalone category. That's just true. So we are amplifying patterns of discrimination and sort of justifying historical marginalization as the product of a smart technical system. Now, the way in which that is being scaled, you know, it's not just one, say, biased police officer or judge. It is that logic scaled across systems that are, you know, infiltrating law enforcement or courtrooms, you know, a, a, across, you know, huge, sorry, there's a, um, there's a guy there, um, that, are, that, are, that are being implemented, you know, at, at massive scale. So, you know, the ways in which you can check that bias, the ways in which you can test it, I think are a new set of problems. And the way in which these sort of technologies are creating basically sort of an an obfuscating smokescreen that makes it harder to exercise your rights, that makes it harder to, you know, say no to a judgment or a determination about you, I think is, you know, it, it's creating a, a, a new set of problems in, in a number of ways. Now, this message must, uh, in some quarters, be quite unpopular. It's, you know, it's very tempting to want to say that artificial intelligence is going to solve a lot of our problems, that, um, you know, this technological fixes will rid us of our societal biases. How, how do you find responses when you kind of, I suppose, pour some cold water on those ideas at, at places like Falling Walls, for example? I mean, I don't, you know, I, I'm, I'm not just standing on a soapbox sort of saying alarmist slogans. Like, I, you know, I've done a lot of research. This is, you know, the claims Ladies I make are, are cited. Do please switch um, off so your I think, mobile you know, I'm, I'm happy to disagree with people on the merits, right? Um, to, you know, talk about, about centralized power and control and, and think about are there ways of actually implementing this technology differently. Um, but I'm not interested in people who kind of make claims to some sort of centrist middle where it's both good and bad without actually offering evidence. And, and what I see is that there are a lot of people who sort of you know, maybe more comfortable with some of the marketing that has come out of the industry, um, but rarely do I see people who sort of contest this view with sort of clearly evidence claims. Now, that doesn't mean I don't have, you know, vast disagreements with people or, you know, different approaches, and I completely respect that, but um, I think in, in general, um, I, I don't, yeah, I, I forgot. The, the question is, do people disagree with me? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. um, but... <laughs> Um, yeah. I, when you do give talks at places like this, which I yeah. suppose aren't necessarily already on site, yeah. what one takeaway do you hope people will leave your, your talk with? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think I can boil it down to, you know, 
I hope people leave recognizing that the issues that AI raises are not technical issues, that these are issues of politics and power, and they need to be confronted as such. Meredith, thank you so much for joining us. My Enjoy pleasure. the rest of the conference. Yeah, you too.